A student of history would uh, be able to readily identify what's been called the seven wonders of the ancient world. Among those wonders that the archaeologists and historians have cataloged are the great pyramids of Egypt. You know, it was estimated that some 100,000 slaves toiled for perhaps 20 years held those monuments to the Egyptian pharaohs and uh, to the gods that they worshipped. Another of the ancient wonders were the hanging gardens of Babylon. The city in the middle of the Mesopotamian uh, Valley, the desert there, that had walls that were perhaps 300 feet tall. And on the inside of the walls, the king had uh, commissioned that gardens be built in terraces. And so they had immense uh, gardens on the inside. Uh, they were interconnected with marble staircases and walkways. It was an elaborate uh, system of irrigation that, that also supplied water to fountains and pools. It uh, obviously uh, was a place of, of beauty and a place of retreat in the midst of the desert. Another of the wonders of the ancient world was that a lighthouse that was at the uh, delta of the Nile River in the, on the Isle of Pharaohs. It was called the, the Pharaoh's Lighthouse. And this lighthouse was some 450 feet high. And not only was the, the size of the structure uh, unusual, is that what made it unusual is that it had a, a series of elevators and winches and windlasses on the inside that would enable them to lift the fuel to the, the top of the lighthouse. It, it's even the, the suggested that there was an elaborate set of reflecting mirrors that concentrated the light so that that lighthouse uh, could be visible. This lighthouse stood for some 1,000 years until it was toppled by an earthquake. Now those things, would, when you think about them, are remarkable. The, what the, the ingenuity of people in the ancient world were able to accomplish. But you know, there is a work from the ancient world that still exists today that, that isn't a relic. It is not something that just exists in people's uh, memory, but it still is a useful tool to give people light and guidance. And that is God's Word for Holy Life. You know, we look at those seven wonders of the ancient world, just the three that we mentioned to you, and what makes them remarkable to us is the construction, the architecture, the complexity of those things. It, it makes us uh, truly be impressed with the producers of it. Well, likewise, when we look at God's Word, the Bible, shouldn't its complexity Shouldn't its usefulness and its value also help us to appreciate the, the, the originator of it? You know, not everyone views the Bible as something that's uh, worthy of consideration. Now, some individuals look at the Bible and, and they feel that, well, it, the Bible is kind of just simply the work of people. And, and even though they could look at a, a physical structure and be impressed by it, the Bible doesn't do that for us. On the other hand, there are individuals who look at the Bible and they are truly impressed. Notice that, or take note perhaps of some examples of what some people have said about the Bible. The 16th President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, uh, he made this statement about God's Word the Bible. He said, I believe the Bible is the best gift that God has ever given to me. A contemporary of Abraham Lincoln the Confederate General Robert E. Lee, he said this, he said, in all of my perplexities and distresses, the Bible has never failed to give me life and strength. Yes, whether it's a statesman or a military a commander, individuals have recognized the value of the Bible. The Encyclopedia Americana says this about the Bible. It says, the influence of the Bible is by no means limited to Jews. It is not just viewed as an ethical and religious treasure whose inexhaustible teaching promises to be even more valuable as the hope of world civilization increases. Yes, uh, individuals who uh, don't view the Bible as necessarily just a religious work, uh, they recognize, though, that the Bible's counsel and advice is indeed capable of changing the thinking in the minds of people. 
You know, every person who praises the Bible and who views the Bible as a gift from God, there are individuals or elements that have worked to discredit the Bible. It's sad to say some of the uh, most vocal and outspoken critics of the Bible have been a modern clergy. They've been joined by philosophers and the scientific community evolutionists, and they have uh, uh, tried to supplant faith in the Bible, even dismissing the value of a belief, not just in the Word of God, but in the existence of the God at all. Notice what one Anglican minister says that, and uh, he's quoted in an Australian newspaper. He says this about the Bible. He says, much of the Bible is just wrong. Some of its history is wrong. Some of its details are obviously garbled. You know, in, in view of changing circumstances and changing viewpoints, uh, individuals in the world have uh, uh, recognize that uh, you know, the Bible's counsel is sometimes in uh, stark contrast to what is accepted. Uh, Time Magazine just last year uh, had an article about a European, a British Bible scholar. And this Bible scholar looked at the, the uh, situation in families uh, around us today, and, and he recognized that the vast majority of families in England and other parts of Europe, that uh, probably 50% of them result in divorce. However, the church's official position on divorce is that, that it's not really an acceptable solution to problem. And so what this Anglican minister did is he, he went back and he looked at the Bible and he looked at some of the accounts that the church used to, uh, to you know, make their determination that divorce isn't the most viable answer. And he said, you know something? He said, maybe we've got it wrong. For example, Jesus' words in Matthew 19, where the Pharisees asked Jesus if it was possible or permissible for a man to divorce his wife on any ground. Well, this scholar says, you know, those questioners were not asking Jesus to make a policy. They were just asking Jesus, do you believe in a no-fault divorce? They weren't asking Jesus what the only basis for divorce is. They just said, do you think that a divorce that's based on, you know, just any reason is acceptable? Therefore, this uh, the scholar says, we use that scripture in Matthew 19 where Jesus says, I say to you, if a man divorces his wife except on the grounds of fornication, he commits adultery, he is to misapply the scripture to say that Jesus was saying that's the only valid reason for divorce. Thus, he says, you know, maybe we have to rethink our modern-day application of the Bible. Yes, individuals who uh, try to make the Bible fit into modern society and, and have the, the views of the Bible dovetail with the views of modern society uh, find it difficult to accept the Bible as the Word of God because it's the viewpoints that are different when it comes to morality and things of that Obviously, there are other elements such as scientific evolutionists, philosophers, uh, that uh, encourage people to think of the uh, uh, enlightenment of man rather than the enlightenment for God. But in contrast with individuals who uh, feel the Bible is outdated, ineffective, the Jehovah's Witnesses feel that the Bible is indeed the authentic, inspired, infallible Word of God. We recognize it as far more than just a a valuable literary masterpiece that could give us some insight into ancient civilization and culture, but it contains the thoughts of our Creator and His instructions to us. You know, in that regard, the Jehovah's Witnesses today resemble uh, the uh, Son of God, Jesus Christ. If you open your Bible, if you would, with me to Matthew chapter 4, and verse number 4, we'll look at a couple of verses that help us to appreciate and how Jesus viewed God's word to Bible, and how we today should view God's word to Bible. Matthew chapter 4, and verse number 4. Jesus was facing a temptation uh, shortly after his baptism, and notice how Jesus responded. In verse number 4, uh, he responded to the temptation to turn stones into loaves of bread. He says, in reply, he said, it is written. Man must live not on bread alone, but on every utterance coming forth through Jehovah's mouth. And then you'll notice that when Jesus said, it is written, 
He then quotes a scripture from the book of Deuteronomy where God's word has instructed people to put their focus not on their physical necessities but upon their spiritual relationship with God. And Jesus cited God's word as an authority for his actions, his decisions, and his beliefs. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses do the same thing today. Because we believe the Word of God is, is, is the inspired, infallible Word of Jehovah's God, we base our teaching, our doctrine, our decisions of life, even our decisions for our future plans upon God's Word. Why do we feel that way? Why, why do we use God's Word so extensively in our life to make decisions and to give us direction? Well, turn with me to John chapter 17 and verse number 17, and uh, you'll see that uh, our feeling about the Bible echoes the feeling of Jesus Christ in the first century. John chapter 17 and verse number 17. In prayer, Jesus said this in verse 17, Sanctify them by means of the truth. Your word is truth. Yes, because Jesus accepted the Word of God as what it truthfully is, the inspired, infallible Word of God. He used it to guide his life. Likewise, we do. You know, as Jehovah's Witnesses, it's been well noted that they, Jehovah's Witnesses are familiar with the Bible. Uh, they're able to use the Bible effectively uh, to reason with people about the, their beliefs, Doing what Acts chapter 17 verses 2 and 3 says, uh, that, that we're not only able to read into the scriptures, but we're able to explain and prove by references from God's word why we believe certain things. And it is indeed uh, a commendable ability that Jehovah's Witnesses have. That they're able to not only understand, but they're able to use the Bible to explain their beliefs. However, wouldn't you agree that uh, being able to reason effectively from the scriptures would require more than just uh, being able to find a supporting Bible text uh, to support our beliefs. But what happens if a person asks you, well, why do you believe the Bible is inspired word of God? Why do you accept what the Bible says, and why do you base your decision upon it? Would you be able to give them an answer? Notice what the First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 encourages us to be able to do. 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse number 15, we're encouraged to sanctify the Christ as Lord in your hearts, always ready to make a defense before everyone that demands of you a reason for the hope in you, but doing so together with mild temper and deep respect. Well, you know, really in context, this Bible verse is uh, talking about being able to uh, give evidence for the reason we believe certain things that uh, we the hope of the scriptures. But wouldn't you agree that the reasons that we give to people would be found in God's word of the Bible? And so couldn't we also extend the application of this Bible principle to what proof can we give that the Bible is indeed the inspired word of God? So that it is capable of giving us hope and we can effectively use this reason for our scriptures. Yes, can we give a reason to individuals who may ask for us the reason for the hope within us about the Bible. So that's the purpose of our discussion, for the remaining part of our discussion, that is to be able to look at the undeniable marks of the Bible's authenticity. So that when individuals ask us, why do you believe in the Bible? Well, we, we can simply say, well, more than why, it's all we can. But well, we'll be able to point to this, or this, or this, or perhaps all of them, if our memory serves us uh, in that way. We're going to look at such things as the Bible's candor. Uh, candor is a synonym for uh, honesty and integrity. We're going to look at the Bible's internal harmony. We'll talk briefly about the practicality of the Bible's advice and counsel. But we'll look at the Bible's accuracy when it comes to matters that are not related specifically to religious or doctrinal matters, such as scientific, historical, or geographical issues. And then we'll take a, a brief look at Bible prophecy. And, and those things together can help us to see that indeed the Bible is authentically the product 
the Lord for you. Let's look at the first one, the candor of the Bible writers. You know, candor is a, a strong proof of authenticity. And, uh, it's something that people value. In the world today, a candor or honesty is sometimes uh, sadly lacking. Recall back in October of the year 2007 that they had those uh, nasty wildfires in Southern California. And there was what, perhaps upwards of a million people that were displaced from their home and were in refugee uh, situations. Well, you may recall that the uh, director of the federal agency, FEMA, uh, appeared on national news and he explained uh, in very clear and concise terms what the FEMA organization was doing to meet the needs of the citizens of Southern California. He answered questions from the audience and uh, he was able to give uh, you know, some encouragement and some glimmers of hope to people that the, the federal government was on top of them. The Washington Post wrote the story about four days later that that news conference was set on a movie stage. That there were no reporters in the room. And, and the people that were asking the questions were actually employees of FEMA who had been given a hand-printed question to ask the director so that he could give the prepared answer that presented the, uh, the viewpoint that they wanted. It, it, and it uh, splashed across the national news that the uh, FEMA organization had misrepresented the, uh, the whole scenario. Now, the problem was that maybe the things that the FEMA director said were accurate, but because they were presented in a, in a situation that did not, did not accurately present the circumstance, uh, it was presented as a news conference, and, and then when it came out that there were no newspaper reporters, no television crews there, no radio crews there, it, it kind of all went away, didn't it? And that the organization lost a lot of credibility. Likewise, we would have to recognize that if the Bible claims to be the Word of God, and yet it does not report things accurately, or if it glosses over or uh, puts a spin on things that uh, make individuals appear to be better or worse than they are, that it would question the Bible's authenticity. So you know, the Bible is remarkable in that over and over again, the Bible does not gloss over, change, minimize, justify, or rationalize the, the conduct or the activities of the people reported in the Bible. Just a couple of examples. So, recall on Thursday evening we talked a little bit about uh, Moses and his uh, uh, response to God's assignment. And how the Bible reports that Moses did just so. In fact, in one chapter of the Bible alone, uh, over 17 times it said Moses did just so. Now, would it surprise you if uh, we informed you that, you know, Moses is the one that wrote that chapter of the Bible? But you know, it's interesting that the chapter of the Bible that describes Moses failing to do God's will just so, and gives us insight into why Moses failed to do God's will just so, Moses wrote that one too. Now, it doesn't surprise us that he would write in glowing terms about his successes, but he very honestly and candidly reports upon his own failures, didn't he? See, the candor of Moses is remarkable. Uh, when we think about what he reported as he wrote uh, what came to be his autobiography. We have other examples. Uh, think about the, uh, the king David. The Bible very clearly and very candidly reports upon David's failings. Not just once or twice, but two or three times that David failed to do what God did. Uh, the most notable and the most uh, famous of those was David's sin with Bathsheba, where he committed adultery. And then when he felt that his uh, sin of adultery was in danger of being exposed because she uh, has uh, reported that she's pregnant, now David compounds his wrongdoing by uh, conspiring and arranging to have her husband put to death. And yet the Bible very clearly and candidly reports upon what David did and what motivated it, and it even reports uh, how David was suffered for a long time because of his indiscretion. Think about the accounts in the Bible where Jesus' disciples abandoned him on the night of his greatest need, when, when he could have been benefited so greatly from the support and the uh, uh, help of his faithful disciples, and yet they all abandoned him. Who wrote those accounts for? Uh, was he 
uh, historian Josephus that tells us that all of the disciples abandoned the Christ, or was it those men themselves who reported upon their failing? But throughout the pages of the Bible, the integrity of the Bible is attested to the fact that, that the witness that they wrote about themselves or others was accurate, even when it was left in flattery. Now, we're not to say that the Bible is the only thing that has the, that integrity of the There are other writings that have it, but it is indeed a strong mark of authenticity. What about the Bible's internal harmony? You know, it's remarkable that the Bible uh, is a book that is harmonious uh, throughout, especially when you just think about the time cover and the amount of individuals involved in it. The writing of the Bible covers a span of some 1,600 years, from uh, 1413 BCE uh, through the first century of the Common Era. There were over three individuals who were involved in writing the Bible. These individuals had varying backgrounds, uh, from individuals that were highly educated, like uh, physicians, a uh, highly educated men like uh, the Saul of Tarsus, who became known as the Apostle Paul, uh, who was a noted scholar and lawyer. We have the kings, David, Solomon, and others. And yet you have lonely people who uh, served as shepherds or just laborers in the field. Yes, men from all walks of life, all backgrounds of life, but were used by Jehovah God to pen the Bible. And yet, remarkably, the Bible has a harmonious theme throughout. It's well been said that the theme of the Bible could be described in one sentence. The sentence found in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse number 9, where Jesus taught us the model prayer. In that model prayer, after praying that God's name should be sanctified, what was it that Jesus taught us to pray for next? Let your kingdom come, and let your will take place on earth as it is in heaven. Think just briefly about the Bible narrative. But doesn't the Bible very early in the uh, opening chapters of Genesis show us how it came to be that God's name needed to be sanctified, that his sovereignty needed to be vindicated? It doesn't it, it explain very early in the Bible how it came to be that God's purpose for the earth was disrupted. And throughout the pages of the Bible, through the uh, works of the prophets, uh, uh, down through the, uh, the account of the Christian Greek scriptures, uh, don't we have revealed to us uh, through prophecies and through uh, actual events what Jehovah has done to bring about the arrangement of the ransom and his kingdom that are going to be the means by which his name is sanctified in his sovereignty and vindication. And then the revelation finishes or concludes with a glorious climax of Jehovah's purpose, the earth being restored to the uh, condition that Jehovah wanted it. As revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4 reports to us that at that time the tent of God will reside with mankind. There will be no more death, sorrow, mourning, outcry, or pain because the former things have passed away, and we will enjoy that new heavens and the new world. Indeed, throughout the Bible, that theme is there, woven throughout, and it uh, is given the, the life to it. Indeed, we have had that sacred secret that the Apostle Paul talked to us, that not only revealed, but we've come to a glorious understanding of it through God's work in life. Yes, the fact that the Bible has one theme, even though there were so many different writers and such a time span, is strong proof that the Bible has but one author who has existed and has directed things throughout the entire time period. Another reason that we have to think about the Bible as the, the, the inspired word of God is its practic the practicality of its counsel. It's well been said that the if there were no other proof of authenticity, the fact that the Bible's counsel works would be strong proof of its authenticity. Because what's remarkable about the Bible's counsel is that the Bible's counsel is not just workable for people who live in the United States or the United Kingdom. But the Bible's counsel works for people who live, if they did live there, in Antarctica 
the continent of Africa, South America, Europe, Asia, Australia. It doesn't matter what continent, what hemisphere of the world you live in, the Bible's counsel works when applied. The Bible's counsel is universal, and it's timeless. A noted uh, educator, William Lane Phelps, who was a Yale University professor from 1901 to 1933, said this. He says, I believe a knowledge of the Bible without a college course is more valuable than a college course without a Bible. See, he thought the Bible's counsel was superior to a college education. John Quincy Adams, another president of the United States, wrote to his son this, and this is what he said. He told his son, speaking of the Bible, he says, It is of all books in the world, that which contributes most to make men good, wise, and happy. How is it that the Bible's counsel can make us good, wise, and happy? Well, let's just think of a few examples of uh, how we know the Bible's counsel can do that for us. Take, for example, the counsel that, uh, that Jesus uh, gave in Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 12. If you turned your Bible to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12 and you read those words, you would very quickly realize that what you are looking at is what has come to be a term or labeled as the golden rule. Where Jesus simply said that we should do to others as we would have them do to us. Now, just from a practical sense, would it matter what hemisphere you lived on, what continent you lived on? Wouldn't the application of those words result in better relations with your neighbors, your family members, business acquaintances? If everyone in the world were to treat every person they came in contact with the same way that they desire to be treated, would you have muggings and beatings and things of that nature? Or would not there be a, a difference attitude in a different circumstance in people's lives. But we talked briefly about the, the view of that uh, the European clergyman about divorce. See, he felt that, that we need to adopt or modify our view of divorce to fit the modern world. And yet the proof has been that the Bible's counsel about divorce truly is the best. When Jesus said that the the divorce should be permanent and it shouldn't be divorces on frivolous grounds at Matthew chapter 19. <laughs> Time has proven that that's the best way. That it has resulted in stable family. In the Christian arrangement it results in stable congregation. In society it results in stable society. Whereas the, the world that we see around us where there's just an increasingly a casual view toward marriage and divorce, that, that we have an increase of, of single parent families, we have an increase of abandoned children, we have all sorts of social problems that come from it. Indeed, Christians have come to appreciate the value of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where the Apostle Paul, under direction of Jehovah God, it encourages us to work hard to make marriage work because it is an institution that is from God, and it should be viewed as sacred and holy. Obviously, the application of Bible principles when it comes to family and marriage isn't easy, but it works. But the counsel of God's Word when it comes to uh, family relationships, the duties and the obligations of husbands, mothers, children, are set forth in scriptures such as the ones found in Ephesians chapter 5 and 6, when applied sincerely, actually work to better family arrangements and increase the happiness of people. But the Bible Council also deals with, uh, well, how do we find proper association? I'm sure most of the young people, especially and those who have been raised as Jehovah's Witnesses, that can almost a, a quote from Heart and Scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, that that association is going to be but the application of that principle applies not just in big things, but in, but in little things too. An illustration that uh, I, I read the other day was uh, talking about put a, a tablespoon of vinegar in a bucket of water. Well, it's obviously going to change the flavor of the bucket of water, but not drastically. But what happens if you put a tablespoon of vinegar in a glass of water? 
You see, the Bible helps us to appreciate that, that there can be association in the world that's necessary and it's obligatory for us because of school, education, work, and it will affect us if we're not careful, but when we concentrate those, this first Corinthians 15, 33 says, it's a corrupting thing. But you know, the Bible does more than warn us against association. It, will, it helps us to find out where we can find the best. And haven't we enjoyed the benefit of uh, uh, appreciating the value of counsel like Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 this week, where it says uh, uh, to meet together, where we can be excited to love and find love. Can you think about it? Can you think of uh, any place in the community of Smith, Alabama, or Steel, Alabama, where you can find better people to associate with than you had to associate with all this week? See, we have the best of the solution because of our understanding and application of life. You know, the uh, reporter, Catherine Bebas, in a magazine called The Watchman Examiner, uh, reported on a, uh, a speech in London by a person who was a skeptic of the Bible. And, and he made the argument in his speech that it was impossible to believe in any book whose authority was unknown. Well, in his audience, there happened to be a person who uh, believed in the Bible, a Christian, so the, uh, this individual raised their hand and, and they asked the speaker a question. They, they said to him, uh, do you happen to know who the compiler of the multiplication table is? No. Well, then obviously you don't believe in it, do you? He says, of course I believe in it because it works so well. That's why I believe in it. That person's logic was irrefutable, wasn't it? The fact that the Bible's counsel works so well, universally, and is timeless, is strong proof that it is from God. Not just the product of a human mind, but of any one time. Well, another mark of authenticity of the Bible is the, the Bible's accuracy. It's accuracy when it comes to uh, things that, such as science, geography, history. It's been well attested to that the Bible uh, has met the test of time. But why don't we just share with you a couple of examples. So turn with me in your Bible to the book of Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter. Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter. <coughs> And we're just going to look at the, one of the statements that the Bible makes about the, the uh, natural future geography of the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Now notice verse number 7. Now these are the words of Moses when he's describing the land to which the Elite people were going to go. Now recall that Moses himself never got to go to the promised land. But notice the description he gives of it in verse number 7. He says, Jehovah your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of torrent valleys of water, springs and watery deeps issuing forth in the valley plain in the mountainous region, a land of wheat and barley and vines and figs and pomegranates, a land of oil, olives, and honey, a land in which you will not eat bread with scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land the stones of which are iron, and out of the mountains of which you will mine copper. Indeed, that's a, a very glowing description of the promised land. Yet it comes from a person who had never literally seen it. So it gives rise to the question, on what basis did Moses say that there would be mountains of iron and copper in the promised land? And interestingly, up until the early part of the 20th century, uh, the fact that iron and copper was in the promised land, well, it was some found to some degree, but Bible scholars felt that there should be more. A geologist by the name of Dr. Ben Cork looked at this Bible account and he said, well, if what Moses said was true, we should be able to find significant deposits of ore in the promised land. So he and a, a team of uh, geologists set out to look. And interestingly, a few miles from the city of Beersheba, he found immense cliffs that were saturated with a, a, a reddish-black looking rock. Now, his geologists immediately recognized that as uh, being typical of mountains that had iron ore in it. So they took samples of the rock and they had it in assay, and it came to be a, an estimated 15 million tons of iron ore were in that bucket. 
they kept looking. A few miles away, they found uh, an outcropping of uh, iron ore that was 65 percent pure iron ore. It took very little processing to get the iron uh, in a useful form. And they found it because they read the Bible. Now, do you think that there had been engineers and, and geologists who had looked to the promised land or had looked for things like that? Yet these individuals looked at the Bible account and said, if the Bible is really inspired by God, and if the Bible really knows what's talked about, we should be able to find something like that. And they did. Think about other things where the Bible uh, demonstrates uh, uh, its uh, knowledge of things that uh, were not well aware, were not well accepted uh, in earlier times. Though the Bible is not a book about science, it's not a treatise on science, when it touches on scientific matters, it is accurate. Take, for example, what is reported for us in the book of Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 22. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 22. There it says, there is one who is dwelling above the circle of the earth. You know, it's interesting that the book of Isaiah was written uh, in the year 730 in my numbers BCE. This was a century, millennia, before the year of 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean river. Now it's well established in history that in 1492 Columbus did circumnavigate the globe, demonstrating that it, that it was possible to travel the earth and not fall off and go to the void. But what Columbus proved in 1492 had been recorded for millennia in Isaiah 40, verse 22, that the earth was right. How did Isaiah know that? When the prevailing view of the day that the earth was flat, and that the earth, that, that if a person went far enough, they would fall away and never come back? How did Isaiah know what the greatest mind of his age failed to appreciate? Think about the, what the Bible writer of the book of Job said, that Moses, Job chapter 26 and verse number 7, that Job, Moses recorded that the earth was hanging upon nothing. This spherical globe was hanging in space upon nothing. Now that was some 3,000 years before the scientist Sir Isaac Newton explained the theory about gravity and the, uh, the laws of the universe, uh, the physical laws of gravity. And it wasn't a, a turtle and an elephant and a strong man that was holding the earth up, but it was the gravitational forces exerted upon it by nearby celestial bodies that held the Earth in a relatively stable orbit around the sun. And he proved it mathematically effective. Well, how did Moses look when it took Sir Isaac Newton 3,000 years later to prove? And it, how did Moses know what wasn't really physically observed until 1961 by human eyes when the first astronaut opened the Earth and didn't run into anything? The Isaiah in the book of Job, wrote a scientifically accurate statement long before people in general, the greatest scientific minds of the age, accepted them as scientific facts. Obviously, Bible writers were not influenced by the philosophy of the day, no Well, given all of those marks of authenticity, the Bible's candor, its harmony, its practicality, the accuracy of the statement, that you may think, well, you know, that's pretty impressive. But you know, there is one more mark of authenticity that it truly is impressive. And that is the Bible's fulfilled prophecy. Now we could speak at, at, for our session of the Bible topic, we could talk about Bible prophecy for hours. And yet we only have about five minutes left for our discussion. Jim, Bible prophecy is indeed impressive. So just think of some of the prophecies that were fulfilled in the, in the life and birth and death of Jesus Christ. In the book of Isaiah, the seventh chapter, in verse number 14, 730 years before it occurred, God's prophet foretold that it would be a virgin that would give birth to this one that would be the Messiah. And the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, uh, records the fulfillment of that inspired utterance. 
that it was an angel that appeared to Mary, the Jewish virgin, and told her that she would become pregnant when the Holy Spirit was a child with her. In Micah, the fifth chapter, verse number two, some 700 years before it occurred, it was foretold that this uh, miraculous birth would take place in a relatively insignificant community of Bethlehem of Ephrata. And the Bible account in Luke chapter 2, verses 4 to 11, confirms that, yes, indeed, circumstances that were such that Joseph and Mary were in Bethlehem when her time for birth came due, and Jesus was born in Bethlehem, even though that was not the city of residence of his parents. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, verses 4 and 5 and 12, describes Jesus' death as a ransom sacrifice being entailed. Psalm 22 and verse number 18, for some 500 years before it occurred, the foretold that the, the individuals associated with Jesus' death would cast lots over his garment. You read the Bible account, you realize that yes, Jesus did die a death as a ransom, and yes, lots were cast over his garment. The Bible foretold his resurrection. The Bible foretold the detailed features about Jesus' earthly life and ministry. All in all, hundreds of prophecies were given about Jesus. And would it be possible for any one person to maneuver and arrange details about the, his the conception, his birth, details of his life, how he would die, when he would die, who would do it, what they would do? See, it just seems to be humanly impossible. Yet with the direction of Jehovah God, the author of the Bible, it is possible and it is a reality. There is the one other prophecy that we can look at that would help us to appreciate it in a very real way, the value of Bible prophecy. It's found in the book of Isaiah, the 44th chapter. Four verses in Isaiah 44 and Isaiah chapter 45. Verse number 27 and 28 of chapter 44 and verse number 1 and 2 of chapter 45 gave some remarkable details some 200 years in advance of the, what actually happened. In the year 732 B.C., the prophet Isaiah foretold that it would be a military commander by the name of Cyrus that would come up against the city of Babylon. Isaiah foretold in chapter 44 that the watery protection of the city of Babylon would become ineffective, in effect dry up so that the city would be defenseless. In chapter 45, uh, uh, verse number 1 and verse number 2, it was foretold that even the gates or the doors of protecting the city, barring entry, would be left open and unlocked. Well, some 200 years later, when the city of Babylon was in a festive mood, uh, there was a military commander by the name of Cyrus that contemplated the city. He realized that if you divert the river before it gets to the city, then there's no water, there's no water in the city's uh, the water defenses, and you should be able to get entry that way. And then when he finally accomplished that, when he went into the city, why well, they discovered that the big gates that closed the riverway, and then the interior doors into the city had all been left unlocked because of the festive mood of the city of heaven. And the city of Babylon fell in the year 539 BCE on in one night without much of a thing. The question though is, do you think that Cyrus was the only military genius that, that looked at Babylon and wanted to conquer it? Well, why was Cyrus the only one who figured out how to divert the river? And why was it that on the exact time that Cyrus diverted the river, that coincidentally the gates and the doors were also unlocked. See, what would have happened if you would have diverted the river and then everything would have been locked up tighter and drunk? But you see, the Bible prophecy unfolded just as the Bible said it was, and history confirms that the Cyrus had a remarkable victory as Bible history unfolded. Indeed, the Bible account of the Bible things that we've looked at, the, the marks of authenticity, help us to appreciate that Yes, we have every reason to believe that the Bible is the authentic, inspired Word of God. But more than just increasing our conviction that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, it helps us to appreciate that the Bible is valuable for us. 
Recall that we talked about the Bible's practical counsel and advice. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs, or Psalm, rather, chapter 19 and verse number 7, that the, the word of Jehovah, the law of Jehovah, can make the inexperienced one wise. Because we have come to trust and believe the inspired counsel in God's word, he gives us wisdom far beyond our personal ability in our position. And we're able to make decisions that reflect a godly wisdom in a godless world. As a result of that, uh, our lives have been greatly affected. And our family life, our relationships with other people, all of those have been directly affected by God's wisdom. But not only that, but you know, our hope for the future has been directly affected by God's wisdom. Because we have confidences in the prophecies of God's word, when we look at this world around us, we see that not just the reasons for despair and hopelessness, but we see them as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy and a clear indicator that other promises of God are on the horizon and are due to be fulfilled for us. Thus, it affects the way we live, our motives, our goals, the activities we have. It affects how we treat others by sharing with them the good news of the kingdom. Because we feel that the Bible is indeed the inspired word of God, it affects our entire life. Yes, it's good for us from time to time to stop and reflect upon what marks the Bible as authentic. Because as we reflect upon those things, it can build our confidence, and it can build our determination to put our complete trust in that authentic word of God and experience the joys and benefits that are due to those who trust the authentic word of God.